This episode brought to you by Stamps.com. Why go to the store to get stamps when you can have them printed right at home for your convenience? Also brought to you by Chime, the award-winning app and debit card that can save you money today. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember, so you don't have to. This is one of my favorite movies. Released in 2008 under a buttload of hype, I'll admit I didn't think this movie was going to be anything that special. I liked Batman Begins, but thought ironically the Batman parts were a little awkward. So with him obviously being more prominent in this one with the Joker who didn't fall into a bat of chemicals, I was already throwing up my hands like a man baby saying this ain't gonna work. But man, did it win me over fast. The acting, the dialogue, the visuals, the intensity, even the action were not just improved on, they were a spectacle. This is what got the mass public saying maybe superhero movies can be more adult than we thought. Every decade or so a comic book movie comes along that does that, and I kind of love it's usually a Batman movie. With that said, like most things declare flawless, I can't quite say this is flawless. There are still a few hiccups when it comes to the story, and little things like poor Bale's bat voice. This city just showed you that it's full of people. Uh, that's a shame. But it goes without saying, this movie left a big impact not only on comic book flicks, but just cinema in general. It challenged how seriously we took heroes and villains that were seen as entertainment for children and teens, and showed there were strong reasons we should still see them as heroes and villains as adults. I'm pretty excited to look this over again, so let's jump right into it. Let's look at the movie that clearly hasn't gotten enough attention, The Dark Knight. It opens with a robbery at one of the mob banks in Gotham. It should be pointed out part of this movie was shot in IMAX, and if they ever release it again on an IMAX screen, it's definitely worth it. I think most people have pointed out the Joker's mask is from an old Adam West episode, and I do legit love that once you know which one he is, the camera does smartly follow him. Like upon second viewing, you are curious of what his reactions are, even if it's all just body language. I know why they call him the Joker. So why do they call him the Joker? I heard he wears makeup. Makeup? Yeah, to scare people. You know, war paint. This seems pretty awesome, I was shocked to find it's only five minutes long. So much happens, I swear it was double that. You'll find they condense a lot of information tight and efficiently in this movie, which until the last fourth works to its benefit, but we'll get to that in a bit. You don't have any idea who you're stealing from? After taking down a random William Fitchner cameo, we find the Joker manipulated the gangsters to take each other out, until he's the only one left to do a badass reveal. Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. As many have pointed out, the plans of the Joker, played by Heath Ledger in his final role, are very easy to pick apart. How did he know there'd be a gap in the buses? How did he know where the choppers would be for the wires? How did he know the exact location of where to stand so that explosion wouldn't kill him? And this is where I just shrug and say, comic book shit. Yes, this is meant to be more realistic, but it is still a guy who flies around as a bat battling a clown. I give leeway on the technicals because comic book movies are supposed to be exaggerated to heighten the effect. So these details really don't bother me. What does bother me is the Scarecrow once again getting the shaft. Despite being in all three movies, he somehow never gets enough time and always comes across as underwhelming. But not as underwhelming as Batman. Wow, Bale really let himself go. Was he getting an early star for his Cheney role? No, these are other vigilantes who want to help. One of the many elements taken from the comics. But the real Batman shows up and... I don't know, it doesn't look that much better. I know I mocked before how silly the suit looks, but in this one, I think it shows the most. I mean, come on, he looks funny. It's not bad all the time, but when they don't know how to shoot him, they really don't know how to shoot him. If I was Gordon, I'd be like, several of these <laughs> banks were, rob <laughs> were robbed by a, <laughs> by a man in clown makeup, <laughs> who's ironically not as funny as, don't look at me, I'm gonna pee my pants. The costume does get an upgrade later, which isn't great, but I can at least look at him without thinking garage sale cosplay. And how about those vocals? What's the difference between you and me? I'm not wearing hockey pants. 
I am doing my best Patty and Selma voice, though. <laughs> We're introduced to District Attorney Harvey Dent, played by Aaron Eckhart. And I'm not gonna lie, his intro made me wonder if critics were wrong when I saw this movie. I see you hostile! Get him out of here. But Your Honor, I'm not done. <laughs> I find you guilty of being a badass mother! Harvey! 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 Even for a comic book movie that was uncomfortably dumb, but it does get back on track pretty fast. As this film just as easily could have been called Gotham City, because a surprisingly good chunk of it is showing people working behind the scenes trying to take down the mob, using clever legal action. And it's legitimately interesting to watch. In a RICO case, if you can charge one of the conspirators with a felony, you can charge all of them with a felony. The movie cleverly utilizes the slow burn, building up to the Joker and why the mob would turn to him. Bruce even takes a liking to Dent, and it's not all because he's dating his ex Rachel, played this time by Maggie Gyllenhaal. When their enemies were at the gates, the Romans would suspend democracy and appoint one man to protect the city. Before the League of Shadows took them down, oh yeah, that's canon. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Painfully poignant, yet poignantly painful. While the mob scrambles to figure out how to keep their money safe from Dent, the Joker, fresh off of robbing them, says for half the money he can help them out. But not before a magic trick. I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. Ta -da! I've seen this trick before, it's in his eye. It's simple, we uh, kill the Batman. <laughs> I have an army of pencils ready to take him down. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but Ledger really does dominate every scene he's in. So many of these weird voices and tics so easily could have backfired, but it adds to the believability that he's intelligent, yet clearly crazy. Anytime he puts his life on the line, I totally believe he'd be okay with dying because he'd be doing what he loves, and he'd probably see it as funny in the end. Speaking of which, the dude is funny. You think you could steal from us and just walk away? Yeah. It's not even that clever a line, yet he made it hilarious. Speaking of hilarious, this is another scene where the Batman costume just cracks me up. Harvey calls him with the bat signal, and he just stands there while Harvey and Gordon talk. You're sitting down there with scum like Wurtz and Ramirez, and you're talking... Oh yeah, Gordon. God, this makes me laugh. He's like a kid waiting for mom and dad to look at his drawing. I drew a picture of a like rainbow. And and talking... It's all black. Oh, yeah, Gordon. Green Lantern yeah, thought it looked pretty. Meanwhile, we see one of the mobsters, played by Michael J. White, just does not have the best luck with clowns. You wanna know how I got these scars? Oh god, not another Joker impression. Mommy gets the kitchen knife to defend herself. He doesn't like that. The Joker changes his backstory constantly, once again a clever holdover from the comic. But I think what makes them especially creepy is he tells them like they really happened. Any of these could have been the actual story, and you would believe it because he's so dedicated to convincing his victims it's real. He probably would slip in the real story just for his own personal laugh. She can't stand the sight of me. She leaves. Now I see the funny side. I'll also say, while the music in Batman movies is usually great, the Joker's theme takes it to a whole new level. In my opinion, a good third of what makes him scary is that disturbing drone that half the time sounds like a broken hairdryer. But Jesus, it's a scary ass broken hairdryer. <laughs> you have nothing to threaten me with. Meanwhile, Bruce flies to Hong Kong to try and get the mob boss who is holding all the mafia's money. They use sonar technology to nab him, leading to a line that's honestly too smart for its own good. Sonar. Just like a uh... submarine, Mr. Wayne. Like a submarine. I have no joke. I think people just miss how obnoxiously clever that is. Batman breaks into the mobster's building and uses what's like a submarine for the air. Or a flying animal like a pigeon. Well, that could have gone better. He's dropped off to the cops where he tries to make a deal with Rachel, Harvey, and Gordon. Wait a minute. Isn't this supposed to be a Joker story? There we go. Be aware. The image is disturbing. Oh my god, I died? One of the bad imposters is murdered, and the Joker will continue to kill every day until Batman reveals himself. I don't care if it turns into a found footage movie, this is the creepiest scene in the flick. Look at me. Look at me! While rehearsing, Kane admitted he forgot his lines because he was so scared shitless of Heath's performance. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> <laughs>
Line schmines, I'm forgetting I have bladder control right now! The Joker kills off a lot of big names upholding the law, naturally in a comedic way. Get in, open it, it'll tell you where you're headed. Oh, I get And he tries to kill Harvey Dent as well, but Batman is there to stop him. Let her go. Very poor choice of words. <laughs> Damn it, I should have said, please throw her off the building so I can save her and she'd date me. That would have been more specific. They survive what they clearly should not have survived, but again, comic book movie. And Bruce tries to figure out more who this Joker, supposedly working for the mob, is. You hammered them to the point of desperation. And in their desperation, they turned to a man they didn't fully understand. Isn't that the intro to like every Trump book now? <laughs> Two more people end up dead and the Joker puts an obituary for the mayor in the paper. That somehow nobody stopped! Where was the editor that day? And one of Wayne's employees notices something a little odd while doing some research. What are you building for him now? Uh, a rocket ship? I want... A rocket ship. Ten million dollars. Fox tells the guy nobody would believe him and he... Believes him. Yeah, it's a little odd, but I guess I can buy it. And at the commissioner's funeral, everyone is seeing if the Joker will follow through with killing the mayor. Commissioner Loeb dedicated his life to law enforcement and to the protection of his community. Oh, this has all been a misunderstanding. It's not Batman he was after, it's Batman well. <laughs> the Joker does get his shot, but it's not for the mayor, it's for Gordon. His family sadly has to be told the bad news. You brought this craziness on us! You did! You brought this on us! At least I don't wear hockey pads. Well now, look at here. I struck stamps. Do you not value stamps? Well, you're a fool. Stamps is more valuable than gold. That is not true. I don't want any confusion, but it's like gold. That is also not true, but they are important. Time is money. Don't waste either with repeated trips to the post office. With Stamps.com, you can skip the trip and focus on how to take your small businesses to the next level. Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process. So you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy. Stamps.com saves you time, money, and stress. But it is not gold. But you can still find it in the ground like I did. That is also not true. I... I don't know what I'm talking about. For more about. than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer. And get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. Whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle, Etsy shop, or full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is a computer a stand a printer, no special supplies or equipment, and you're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. I didn't have a line for this cutaway. Stop overpaying for shipping with Stamps.com. Sign up at Stamps.com slash nostalgia for a special offer that includes a four-week free trial, free postage, and a digital scale. The long-term commitments of contracts at Stamps.com slash nostalgia. Why, look what else I found here. I found Chime. A business in the ground I did. Kick off 2022 with a better checking account with no monthly fees. Chime, an award-winning app and debit card, has no overdraft fees, foreign transaction fees, monthly fees, or service fees. With over 60,000 fee-free in-network ATMs at many locations like most Walgreens, 7-Eleven, and CVS, you can access your money when you need it, where you need it. You can also send money to anyone, even if they're not on Chime. Or digging for Chime, that's a thing apparently. Be free for you and no cash out fees for them. Make your first good decision of the new year and join over 10 million people using Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com nostalgia. That's Chime.com nostalgia.
Why looky over there, that gopher with a high-pitched, quick voice. It's quite a coincidence. You're gonna hear a lot of information fly at you really quick. Banking services provided by and debit card issued by the Bancorp Bank or Stride Bank and a member's FDIC. Get fee free transactions at any Money Pass ATM in the 7-Eleven location and at any All Point or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. Otherwise, out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Sometimes pay anyone instant transfers can be delayed. The recipient must use a valid debit card or be a Chime member to claim funds. If you don't want to dig a hole deeper than the one I'm digging right now with this sketch and this embarrassing accent, you sign up right now. There's Chime in that there mountain. Sky's very hot today. Then he goes to a nightclub to confront one of the mobsters working with the Joker. Why is nobody doing the bat to see? Meanwhile, Harvey, kind of playing to the split personality thing, but not a ton, threatens one of the Joker's men using a trick coin, saying he has a 50-50 chance of living. You're the symbol of hope I could never be. If anyone saw this, everything would be undone. A man in a bat suit talking in a silly voice is saying, You're acting crazy! Batman says he'll turn himself in to stop the bloodshed, but not before hitting on Rachel one more time. You know that day that you once told me about when Gotham would no longer need Batman? You can't ask me to wait for that. It's happening now. I'll just say it, Bruce's simp romance with her is kind of pathetic. She's seeing someone else, she seems happy, he's now going to prison, yet he constantly makes a play that maybe they can work out. You once told me that if the day came when I was finished, that we'd be together. Bruce, don't make me your one hope for a normal life. Did you mean it? <laughs> Did you mean it when you said you marry me when we grew up? This is kind of embarrassing. Maybe that's the idea? Like, despite all his brilliant badassness, this is the one area where he's kind of a desperate dork? But with so much else going on in these movies, their chemistry has never been that strong. If you turn yourself in, they're not gonna let us be together. I need someone more mentally sound, like a guy who would kill a man literally on the turn of a dime. In a surprise twist, though, Harvey tells everyone that he's Batman. I am the Batman. <laughs> I really love that Nolan realizes the trick to get a good Two-Face is to get Harvey down. He knows in order to make the transformation more painful, he needs to be relatable. And a lot of time is dedicated to him being portrayed as heroic and likable, and not to a fake degree. For the most part. Your Honor, I'm not done. <laughs> Just stop reminding me that Clip's in this movie. The Joker rigs it where they have to take the lower route. That lower fifth will be like turkeys on Thanksgiving down there. Which. They clearly don't! There's tons of ways around this! And the Joker chases them, trying to blow open the truck. These things are built for that, right? He's gonna need something a lot bigger to get through this. I heard that. But Batman shows up, and where I really bashed the action in the first film, I can say not only is it a lot better in this one, but it has one of my favorite action sequences of all time. This chase is so well laid out, keeps the adrenaline high, and brilliantly has no music so you can focus only on what you're seeing. Again, the music is great in this, but cutting it out here makes everything strangely more epic. There's not even much dialogue. The language of the scene is practically nothing but crashes and explosions. It's also edited much better. In the last one, everything was so shaky and cut around too quick. Here, you can make out everything and really feel like you're riding alongside them. When Batman crashes through a window, it doesn't just cut randomly to somewhere else. You actually get to follow him through the window this time. You get to experience what he's experiencing. Look at the clowns firing at them. It's like you're in a live action video game. To a point where every time I drive a lower whacker, I can't help but get a little bit of an adrenaline rush because I always think of this scene. On top of that, almost all of it is really there. Yes, there was some model work and a few moments of CG, but they were used only when they had to be. They went the extra mile and actually had all these cars blowing up or crashing. You simply feel more immersed when you know what you're looking at is really there. Oh, you wanna play? Come on. It all builds up to a topper that everybody saw in the trailer, but you got so wrapped up, you forgot it was coming. And everybody roared in the theater when it finally happened. <laughs> this leads to the ultimate showdown shit Gotham has ever had, with Batman charging towards the Joker. Batman! 
This leads to, I'll completely admit, a surprise that shocked the hell out of me. We got you, you son of a bitch. Again, the crowd went nuts here. I think it shows a movie is really working when there isn't a character you're not rooting for. It's kind of like the Coyote and Roadrunner, because everything with me is for some reason. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad. If they're passionate and interesting, you do want them to succeed in one way or another. Things go south, though, when both Harvey and Rachel disappear. Thus, the Joker and Batman finally have a sit-down. This is basically a Funhouse mirror version of Heat, but who gives a shit? It's great. I'll show you. When the chips are down, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. Joker says he's trying to make a point as an agent of chaos, which is a little contradictory. If you're an agent of chaos, you shouldn't have a point. But he does go back and forth between proving something and just spreading madness that I think it kind of acquits itself. Don't worry, I'm gonna tell you where they are. And that's the point. He tells him where Harvey and Rachel are as they're both in separate buildings about to be blown up. Batman goes to save Rachel, but discovers the Joker switched the addresses. Some Okay, so even when this movie came out, the trope of killing the love interest was already kind of played, but not so often in comic book movies. I guess you could argue Lois Lane, but she comes right back, so I don't think it really counts. In my opinion, this does what Spider-Man didn't have the balls to do, and Amazing Spider-Man 2 was late to the party with. My only problem? He doesn't mourn her that much! Yeah, we get him looking over the wreckage and sulking in his room a bit, but Alfred's like, eh, you can take it, and it's never brought up again by him. Didn't you think there might be some casualties? Things were always gonna get worse before they got better. Honestly, Harvey takes it a lot harder, which makes sense as this, mixed with the fact that his face got blown off, drives him insane. And this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think maybe the movie should have ended here. This is the emotional height of the film, the Joker escapes, Harvey is scarred. We're at an hour 40 minutes, a perfect running time. Imagine if it just stopped like this. That would have been goddamn chilling. Seeing how they build up another one at the end anyway, I feel like this could have worked. But instead, we have 50 minutes left, and honestly, what's in this 50 minutes could have filled a whole other film. I guess because they wanted to squeeze in so much, it's condensed in the final third. But like I said before, it is condensed well. Not only is half of Harvey's face scarred and a pretty great effect that still holds up, but his double-sided coin is too. I love this because it represents how now he can't play tricks, he can't make his own luck. It worked for a while, but it cost him dearly, and now he's spun into the opposite, where everything is one way or another, brought on by chance. I told you, I'm a man of my word. I just Scrooge McDucked myself. As you'd expect, though, he sets the money ablaze and calls in on a talk show with the employee from earlier saying he's gonna reveal who Batman is. Joker says he likes the mystery now, and if the guy isn't dead in an hour, he'll blow up a hospital. Yeah, like I said, they try to squeeze in a lot in this last third. Mission. With people scrambling, both evacuating hospitals and trying to kill this guy, Bruce does manage to save him, but make it look like it was an accident. That's a very brave thing you did. You trying to catch the light? Hey, thanks, Batman. I guess I ruined that. With the Joker wearing easily the funniest costume in the movie. Hi. And yes, this was a popular cosplay for a while. He convinces Harvey that he's just a mad dog and he should take vengeance out on those who let him off his leash. This begins Harvey's coin flipping, and I do like he puts the Joker in his trial of chance too. It really does make sense a villain based on chaos and a villain based on chance would fit well in the same movie. You live, you die. Mm, now we're talking. Of course, he gets lucky, Harvey escapes, and the Joker blows up the hospital that again really was demolished and looks amazing. There is a rumor that the explosions accidentally stopped and Ledger improvised the scene of him hitting the detonator until they went off again. But look at the camera work, look at the staging, look at how many explosions there are. That's not how this works. Nolan even said they purposefully had it stop so they could set the demolition part up while keeping Ledger safe. Even if the rumor isn't true, though, it's still a spectacular moment. But then we get another climax. Yeah, honestly, the whole third act is just one long climax. We're after the Joker kidnaps Anthony Michael Hall. If you don't want to be in the game, get out now. Random. 
He puts a bomb on two fairies who must make a choice which boat will blow up. And if they don't choose in an hour, they'll both blow up. And you might want to decide quickly because the people on the other boat may not be quite so noble. First off, this kind of feels like a two-faced plan, like you're forced to choose one or the other. And second, this is where the movie stops being great and instead just becomes good. We're introduced to this idea of Batman using everyone's cell phones to track everything. This alone could be an interesting movie instead of just the last half hour. This is wrong. I've got to find this man, Lucius. I'm also going to take a wild guess and say this is a commentary on the George W. Bush administration. Harvey starts killing the people who wronged him in ways I still don't fully understand. Your driver. <laughs> Did he get out of the car or what? What happened there? The people on the ferry are debating what to do like it's a Saw movie. The hostages are switched with the henchmen. We have to have a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the Joker. Even though it's all done well, after the hospital bit, I'm kinda done. This would have been a great climax in another Dark Knight movie. But they squeezed it all in here and that's what it feels like. It feels like it's squeezed in. The little leeway I'll give it is that it is like what the previous film said. It is about escalation. The chaos never stops. It's relentless. Everything seems spinning out of control and crumbling with Batman trying to pick up the pieces. That is essentially the Joker. I just think there were better ways to do it than to just add an act four. But it is still very intense and keeps your interest. As after neither fairy blows the other up and Batman stops the Joker from detonating them both, the Joker reveals how destroying Harvey was his ace in the hole. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say, when I saw this clip in the trailer, I was saying to myself, did they make the Joker fly in this? <laughs> Even though the Joker's arrested, Harvey kidnaps Gordon's family and gives them the same coin toss as the others. If you're not going to hurt my family, just the person you love most. Is it your wife? It can't be your daughter. We haven't decided if she's going to be Batgirl in the future or not. We're definitely going to screw up Robin, but we have to hold out on this one. You don't want to hurt the boy, Harvey. <laughs> Your mother's in here with us, Karis. Would you like to leave a message? <laughs> Batman arrives and through a violent tussle, Harvey falls to his death. To save his reputation, Batman tells Gordon that the story has to be that he killed Harvey's victims. I killed those people. If you're not, I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. There is an irony that they're saying spying on people is wrong, but lying about who killed someone is fine. But you get the idea of the lesson. He's taking a hit for Gotham. It's about endurance. It's about sacrifice. It's about making people even more freaked out about fake news. Okay, this didn't age that great. But it's the thought that counts. A watchful protector. A dark knight. And that was The Dark Knight. Despite its few problems, I still think it's fantastic. This really did change how serious people took superhero movies. It hit just the right notes at just the right time. The lines are so quotable, the dilemmas so intriguing, the characters so memorable. For a while, this Joker became an icon of, shall we say, meaningful madness. Despite being a villain, he reflected a sort of anti-authoritative chaos that struck a chord at that point in time. The same way Phoenix would in his own way at a different point in time. While okay, I can't say it's perfection, the amazing moments overshadow all of the flaws and gave you an amazing experience that changed the cinematic landscape of this genre. It's still one of my all-time favorites, and I know I'm not alone. If you haven't watched it in a while, pop it in again, and watch one of the greatest comic book movies ever made. I'm a nostalgia critic, guy. Remember it so you don't have to. You don't want to hurt the boy, Harvey. Why, yes, I am shooting two charity shout-outs in one day. <laughs> no, I just got the exact same shirt and chaplain back up there uh, just because I was nostalgic for a week ago. No, I'm shooting these back-to-back. -back. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a charity shout-out, and this one is Echo. Uh, Echo exists to reduce hunger and improve lives through agricultural training and resources. A non-denominational Christian organization, its international headquarters is located on a tropical agricultural demonstration farm in Florida. Uh, 
ECHO provides agricultural and appropriate technology training and resources to develop uh, to development workers in more than 180 countries. Among these resources is a large knowledge of uh, a large knowledge base of practical information, experience, technical support, and an extensive seed bank focused on highly beneficial plants. ECHO also works to identify, validate, document, and use the best practices in sustainable agricultural and appropriate technology. And finally, ECHO creates opportunities for field-based practitioners to connect with each other, to share experiences, ideas, and encouragement. Uh, with a four-star rating on Charity Navigator in a time of rising food prices, more women and children and men are facing hunger and malnutrition, and this is really a great way you can help. So you can check out the site, you can see all the great stuff that they do there. Uh, definitely spread the word, or donate if possible, because uh, there are so many people out there that uh, definitely should not go to bed hungry, and this is something that can really, really help with that. Check them out, see if it's up your alley. If not, go ahead and uh, share that link, because again, so many people deserve to know all the good that so many good people out there are doing. So that's about it. I'll see you next time. Take care.